Welcome to the Working Class Bowhunter Podcast. That's right. You found your home. Come on in. It's nice and cozy. This is the show for all hunters. I was going to say working class bow hunters, but anybody can be here. You can enjoy this. Come on in. Get comfy. How are you? Take a load good, off. Good to see you. Drink a beer. Hey, nice Relax. to be here. The podcast is presented by Scent Crusher. Scentcrusher.com. We talk about it all the time. Steve takes a poop. We run the room clean. No more stank. We're good there. Uh, we live out of our gear bags all hunting season. It's kind of a no-brainer. Once you, once you get some Scent Crusher gear in your hands, you're like, I've been missing this. The Ozone Go. That's, that's where a, it's at. Yeah. I, that's I'm, where it's at. Slammer. I'm a fan of all of it. Right now, my favorite's the room clean still. It's kind of always a favorite because it reminds me every day how effective it is. You just walk by and click it on. Beep, beep. Bloop, bloop. All you do. It's on. HHA Sports, HHASports.com. In our opinion, it's a leader in single pin sights. Um, we shoot the Optimizer Kingpin, the fixed position, and they have the dovetail version. I like the fixed position this year. I've shot the dovetail, love that one too, but I went fixed position for my elk hunt just for a little more compact, I guess. Mm -hmm. Hey, 3D season's coming up, and if you want to beat your buddies, make a little money, they're like, ah, oh, all these dudes got all these crazy pins in their uh, view, eh, just go to one. Give it a try at sure. least. Yeah. The podcast is also brought to you by Elite Archery. Uh, the Ritual mm. series is out now. Mm -hmm. 31, 35, and the I guess the, we call it now the 33, Three. even though it's the original <laughs> Ritual. Yeah. But it's a little bit of everything for a little bit of everyone. What do you like? You like them long? You like them short? You like in the middle? We got something for you. Uh, check them out, EliteArchery.com. Also proud to announce the podcast is now brought to you by North American White Tail Championship, I, or I guess if the more proper way, the Bone Collectors North American White Tail Championship. Uh, we did a podcast. Oh man, I don't know how long ago it's been now. With Steve Schmidt, he is the owner of that and the operator of it, and it's super cool. You sign up, get a bunch of goodies. You pretty much pay for it. you get your money back right away and gear for your entry fee. Yep. But you can win some serious cash. It's kind of like the professional bass tournament for bow hunters. I mean, hunters. Um, exactly what it is. You can win fifty grand, a bunch of prizes. We can Monthly win hunts. prizes too, dude. What was what did you say? What was the number one for um, our region? Well, Iowa. 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 was one hundred sixty nine inches. See, that's big. But I would have thought it would have went bigger. Yeah, there's some there's sure. some regions where like the winner, the couple of the winners were like in the one twenties. Virginia and West Virginia, only one guy killed a buck. Only one, yeah, only See, one guy. Was so successful. Virginia, West Virginia. It, so next season, this is your season. Like you know, sign up, you could win this. Yeah, year. yeah, you, you got this. You know what's funny? The guy who took runner up in Michigan heard about this championship. Through our podcast, that's awesome. So, really, yeah. Awesome. He reached out. He's like, "Hey, outside. and the runner runner up's got a free prime uh, prime bow too." So. Yeah, you get a free bow. And the thing is, even if you enter, you can still win wild card stuff to where you can go to hunt in the championship yep. and win fifty grand and monthly giveaways too. Yeah, and they add a couple more regions this year. We'll get into it more later. We just want to announce that partnership. Super cool. Super proud of that. And I think it's something we should all be behind um, because oh, it's I'm doing it. One, year. it's fun. And it's it's a competition, but it's fun. It can make the regular guy can go in there and make fifty grand, guy yeah. or gal. Well, and it brings uh, everyone together. Well, it's like your yeah. friendly deer competition you do every year. Like, like what usually we do, we would throw in ten, twenty bucks. Whoever kills the biggest buck gets the money. Yeah, the yeah and it, or you don't. You just have a bunch of cool shit. And Steve, who's exactly. running it, is an absolutely great human being. The best. Uh, so it's th this organization <coughs> is a great organization ran by great people. You need to check it out. Next season could be your season. Check your region. And let's be honest. If Michael Waddell's talking about it, it it's got to be all right. Yeah, Waddell's talking about it. I mean, come <laughs> on. Pretty oh, like, come on. Yeah, you're you're going to argue with Waddell. The podcast is also brought to you by Hunter's Blend Coffee. You can oh. save yourself 10% work code working class. Hunter'sBlendCoffee.com. Also, Big Time. BigTime.com. They got the app. You can find our podcast there. Uh, the swag, the 30 out 6, the Buck Brunch. The, the the big, mineral block the ADG <sighs> trail camera sorry Eric the big time is killing it right dude now. I would say I would highly killing recommend it. that buck brunch because I kill the buck I kill the buck in the buck brunch uh, so if I did it you could too so Steve's just sure. a basket weaver if he can kill I'm, a buck that's right I'm that's and he loves you. brunch dude I yeah. love brunch <laughs> yeah. and so if I can kill a buck in, in a plot brunch. that I planted, dude, you ever wake yeah. up for brunch 
Huh? You, you ever wake up in time for brunch? Dude, endless mimosas? Are you kidding me, bro? How did I get this figure without drinking a shitload of orange juice and sugary champagne? Hey, I want... Not, <laughs> that's a great plug for Big Time. What I want you to do now is get serious. Give us a veteran shout-out for the show, and we'll cut right into this well-anticipated episode. All right, the uh, vet shout-out this week is going to be for uh, our buddy Cody, Cody Morris. He's not really our buddy, but he uh, served for us for... But he's going to be our buddy. Um, he was a uh, U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, his buddy sent it in, said, uh, what's up to you fellows at WCB? First of all, he wanted to thank us for uh, all the vet shout-outs. Um, he'd like to give a shout-out to his uh, his main man, Cody Morris. Uh, and Cody's from Greencastle, Pennsylvania. Um, he was a badass uh, canine handler in the Marine Corps and continues to serve this country as a uh, as a community police officer um he's the guy that introduced this podcast and blake we appreciate you letting us know uh i, I am not gonna butcher your last name but uh blake thank you for letting us know uh about cody morris and his service to this country cody we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your service to this country and your continuing service to this country as a police officer we Cannot thank you enough. Even if it, we'll do the shout out, that's what we can do. But we always want to do more. Thank you for your service to this country, and uh, we appreciate you listening. Thanks, Cody. Yep, thank thank you. you, Cody. All right, guys. Hope you enjoy this episode. Hey, this is Jim Shockey, and you're listening to the Working Class Bull Hunter. <laughs> I'm Chase Rolson with Rubline Marketing. This is Jeff Lindsay. This is Michael Pitt. Hey, everybody. It's John Dudley from Knock On TV. Hey, guys. This is Jared Scheffler from Whitetail Adrenaline. Hi. I'm Taylor Drury from Drury Outdoors. Hey, this is Nick Munson from Bow Collector. Hey, this is Melissa Buckman. Working Class Bow Hunter. Working Class Bow Hunter. Working Class Bow Hunter Podcast. Working Class Bow Hunter Podcast. Working Class Bow Hunter. Working Class Bow Hunter. Working Class Bow Hunter. You're listening to the Working Working Class Bow Hunter. That's right. This is a podcast for Billy Joe Lunchbucket, the working man, just like me and you. My name's Travis T. Bone Turner from The Bone Collector. Thank you for tuning in. Nobody pushes the envelope like Working Class Bow Hunter. Hey, this is Jules McQueen, and you are listening to the Working Class Bow Hunter podcast. It's really, really not that good. Good, 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 good. All right, on the phone with us, we have uh, one of my top three favorite Canadians. Uh, this is actually a huge, <laughs> huge uh, honor and a privilege to talk to uh, this man. Uh, and we uh, want to mention that he is now uh, a very successful recording artist. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Shockey. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to know why I'm only top three. Like, <laughs> let me guess: Shania Twain, Shania Twain, Captain Kirk. Who, who else? Who else? Uh, think, uh, Mike Babcock's my one of my favorite Canadians because I'm a big well, yeah, Leafs oh, fan. Okay, oh, okay, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. <laughs> and Brian Adams because he played the Grey Cup. But with this uh, song, you might be playing the song at the Grey Cup. Hopefully, one day. So I just throw it out <laughs> that's, that's there. Actually, just a, a, a go way back in history. I, uh, when Brian Adams was at his peak, uh, I used to have an antique store in Vancouver, and he was one of my customers. So I, I've been in Brian's house back in those days in his recording studio. I can't remember his his buddy's name there. They wrote all those those hit songs. So really, so it was, anyway, that's a bit of tri- a bit of trivia for uh, for anybody that's uh, a music buff. <laughs> Man, how about that? That's awesome. I did not cool. expect that. That's wild. <laughs> well, Jim, we appreciate you coming on the show, man. You're you're one of my childhood hunting heroes, man, and still are my hero. So it's kind of crazy that you're on our show. I can't really believe it. Uh, but no, nah, thank you, man, so much. I know we got a lot of cool things. But, well, some cool things we want to talk about, and then some serious stuff we want to talk about. We're the the podcast likes to joke around a lot, but sometimes we got to cover mm. some serious topics and and the hunting realm, I guess. Um, well, let's talk about you had a song that went number one on the blues charts on iTunes. <laughs> it, yeah, it was, it was a song called "Howl With Me." I, I was actually it was, it was during that period. I don't know if you were following when our son-in-law Tim Brent 
married to Eva, our daughter. Uh-huh. Um, I guided them up in the Yukon in our opening territory, the Rogue River opening territory, uh, for a, a huge grizzly bear. The, the bear had torn apart our camp, I mean, destroyed it. And, and uh, we, you know, we went after the bear, and, and Tim got it. Uh, you know, the bear was not afraid of it. It came right at us, actually, at, uh, you know, 30 yards, just kept walking right at us. And wow. No question that, that we were just prey to it. But, but you know, he killed it and, and posted a picture and got absolutely lambasted on social media. You know, this what's the guy's Richard Gingivitis or Richie Gingivitis, whatever his name is, the comedian guy, Hollywood, you know, just hammering <laughs> Tim, who's the nicest guy in the world. Uh-huh. And, and so I, after that, well, while that was going on, I was at home uh, hiking, and I I just was angry. I mean, I was just angry. It was time to, I'm sick and tired of being pushed around and the intolerance. You know, we're labeled as, as hunters, as, you know, redneck louts with no higher sensibilities and and yeah, it's just untrue. We're, we're possibly the most tolerant people in this world today, mm-hmm. based on what I'm seeing. So, so I, I got tired of it, and I just said, "Okay, enough." And I, so I wrote that song called "Howl with Me." You know, if you want to be free, howl with me is one of the lyrics, and and uh, and the song went to number one on the uh, iTunes blues charts. I actually, passed the Blues Brothers and Eddie James. It was it was pretty cool. Wow! Congratulations. I, that is crazy. Thank you. I, I, I know one thing that musicians uh, is reason they're starving because even doing all that and you know a gazillion downloads all over the world, you know there's not enough money to to barely record a second song. So it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> note to sell: don't don't quit my day job. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But for the record, we, I, I actually do have a, a second song, a follow up that uh, I was supposed to be laying down the final. Uh, voice tracks here this evening but i picked up a bug here about a month ago in the convention so i my tiny voice is a little bit nasally so, <laughs> so we'll, we'll have to wait for for a few weeks and i thought you're gonna say the bug was us <laughs> I thought you're, i'm sitting here talking to you idiots yeah, instead yeah. of recording that song <laughs> yeah so that's right instead of recording what i'm hoping is that the, the next number one folk song this time that uh I might even I could actually do it in a rap version too. Yeah, there you go. When are you well, gonna get <laughs> tackle all the genres? Jim Shockey oh, featuring the Wu Tang <laughs> Clan. <laughs> yeah, so, so anyway, you're 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 saving my voice from uh, from uh, embarrassment right now from being at the recording studio not being able to hit a single note. So. Wow, that's cool. I'm sure a lot of people didn't know that you you were a musician, but I'm sure there are a lot of people did know. But it's kind of cool that you're you just multi talented all over the place, man. Uh, you, you know, here's the thing, and 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 if you go back in history, like I'm standing in our museum right now, and I'm standing in front of a book that's from 1507, and it, it's it's a book on natural history, and it, it's by Plinius. And in those days, we weren't so diversified. So everybody was an artist, everybody was a musician, everybody was a theologian, everybody was a scientist, everybody was an explorer, and everybody was a hunter. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's what we all were back then. So hunters, we were everything back then. And then over time, we diversified. You know, the artists left the scientists, and never the twain shall meet. And then, you know, the explorers left the scientists, and then the hunters left the explorers. So, you know... All of us that are hunters, we have it inside of ourselves, all of us, to, to recognize great beauty. You know, we, we have our cathedrals. We're, we're all spiritual to the nth degree because of our relationship with, with nature and being mm-hmm. in the outdoors. We, we all have it inside of us. I, I just have maybe had the, the motivation or for what, whatever reason, the the and the momentum to to try all these other aspects of our of what we all are. You know, I I, I do get some time. I, I to play guitar now and then. I you know, I don't mm-hmm. have a nine to five job, but I basically hunt. And and right. you know, so so I I can I can go back to our roots. But all of us have it inside of us. Inside us, it's just to varying degrees. And you know, some of us are more spiritual. Some of us are more artistic. Some of us are tend to use more logical scientist side. But, but all of us have all of those elements in us as hunters. I and mean, we're all explorers. Every one of us is, is an explorer. 
I love that outlook, man. I did not That's expect deep. that. That was beautiful. I did not ex- ever expect that on this podcast. That is cool, man. <laughs> that is really cool. And that, that goes awesome. back like... That's probably some of your attraction to, to having the museum that you have. And maybe just kind of go into that because I think it's really cool. You know, every now and again, you'll post a video online of something that you have in the museum and, or maybe just tell a little bit about it. But how, how did that all come to be? Did you just have a collection and say one day, like, hey, I should show this off, show this off and have a place to put my collection and kind of go uh, from there? Well, you know, you know, all of us that are hunters, we, we – we head out into the wildlands and we bring back our trophy. You know, that, that's, you know, right nowadays that, that word trophy hunter is stigmatized and, you know, they, they've marginalized us because of that. But, but we bring that trophy back as a food for our families, which is historic. We've always done that for our tribe, our community, uh, you know, starting with obviously the smallest element, which is our family, ourselves and our families. But, we brought back the trophies, the antlers, the horns, as a memory. And if you look at the definition of trophy, that's what it is. It's a memory of an event, an occurrence, or an accomplishment. And and so we've always done that. And I, I, I've done that since I was only 10 years old. I started collecting for this museum. You know, I, mean, I didn't know the name of the museum back then. I didn't know where it would be. But I sure as heck knew what I wanted in it eventually, you know, natural oh. history, cultural arts. And with, with a, a, you know, at the time I didn't understand conservation, but I knew that there was far more to hunting than just going on and killing an animal, cutting its head off. I mean, that, that's how we've been stereotyped. But mm-hmm. even back when I was 10 years old, I knew it was more than that. So I, so I started gathering for this venue, uh, well, let's see, I'm 61 now, so 51 years ago, wow. half a century, wow. I started gathering, yeah, my first collections were, were back then, and they're in the museum, you know, cartridges, old old cartridges. Uh, so so it's, uh, it's something that, you know, it's inside me, it's inside all hunters. We, you know, we have what we call our trophy rooms, which, you know, again, they would have us believe that that's just a bunch of dead animal heads, but it's not. You know, there's memories. That's what a trophy room is. And this, mm-hmm. this, you know, we, we love bringing our friends in, and not because you know it's for our egos. That's how they would represent us in the popular press. It's because we love to tell the stories, to share the stories, which, if you go back historically, is how we passed on the knowledge. You know, I did it this way. I did it this way. I climbed up the mountain. And I got over this ridge, and you describe it. Your 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 fellow tribal member. Learns and oh maybe I'll try that next time and that, that's what that's what a trophy room is and, and if you just take it to the next level you open the doors for the public you you have a museum a natural history museum and that's that's what this this museum is it's called the the Hand of Man Museum of Natural History Cultural Arts and Conservation and and all of us all of us have a little tiny museum. And I guarantee every one of you guys do. Yeah. You'll have a room with oh, yeah. your, your animals, and you'll have you know, whatever, a, yeah. a, a shed antler that you found. Uh, who, who knows what it is? You yeah. know, I, I've had, the, you know, I've had the, the blessing of being able to travel this entire world into the furthest reaches of, of, of this world. And, and so I've, and, you know, I've had the wherewithal to be able to gather the artifacts from, from all these various cultures that are out there, these, these tribes, the, the nomads, uh, the people that I've been with. And, and if they're so far advanced, civilized, I don't know, I'll use quotations around that, that you know they don't have any of that nowadays, they did. Everyone did. I mean, you know, 10,000 years ago, we were hunter gatherers now. You know, then we did, became agrarian cultures, and, and you know now... You know, I guess if you add up the number of people in the world today, you know, there, there's as many, uh, you know, uh, agrarian people as there was hunter-gatherers over the entire course of history. But it just means that, you know, there's 7.5 billion hunter-gatherers. We haven't gone anywhere. We're still here. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's, this museum is to pass on the knowledge that, that anybody with that, with an interest in the outdoors, you know, interest in wildlife, interest in cultures around the world, um, 
they're they're going to find something in here that uh, that they're that's going to pique that interest and and hopefully at the same time educate them about conservation and, and this war on wildlife that's happening around the world and that all of us need to be on the same side not mm-hmm. trying to shove our ideologies down the other one's throat. You know, I, anyway, we're, we'll get into it. That's a whole different topic. You guys, like, you want to, you, it's pretty light fun, but, but uh, yeah, I, that's what this museum is. I, I've had this vision. It's open to the public 365 days a year. It's near the town of Duncan in British Columbia on Vancouver Island, so north of Victoria, about an hour. Uh, Victoria is the capital of British Columbia, and it's on Vancouver Island. Uh, Very beautiful, cool. beautiful. Is it in, yeah, it's an old school that our kids actually went to school in a uh, long wow. time ago. So, they, you know, they decommissioned it, and I picked it up and and uh, reinvented it. That's so awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> I wonder how your kids were like, hey, remember that place that you used to go to school at, you know, and you didn't like it? Yeah, well, I just bought it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say, here's a Christmas present for your old school. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> oh, I've got great. an idea for it. <laughs> yeah, that's a hey, you want to be grounded you're going back to your third grade classroom okay it's it's over <laughs> that's yeah, very I'm cool a, man. i'm actually i'm actually standing in the kids third grade class right now it's pretty funny oh, wow. that's crazy that's crazy oh, hey, i forgot to mention i'm a psychic <laughs> only yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, that, if that's the case then tell me what i should be investing in. i need to make some more money to pay for this joint <laughs> invest in the working class bow hunter podcast <laughs> there you go yeah i hear the circulation is just about to go way up yeah. yep that is right that is right Man, that's got to be so much fun for you to do, like to have people come in there and see everything that you've collected and just from all your travels and everything like that. It's It's got to just be a really cool thing to watch people come in and appreciate your collection. Well, it, it, you know, it's not even that it's my collection. It, it's that they appreciate what's here. And, and you know, like we just literally 15 minutes ago, a group of 20 people from the local bank it was it was their their um, i guess employee appreciation afternoon and this is what they chose to come and so 20 of them came through here and it was it was it was awesome to see them you know opening up their eyes first and then their minds and by the end yeah every one of them came up and and was just oozing with with wonderful praise about how great this place is and it it's it's not that it's great we all have it every one of us that hunts has this we live with it you know the wildlife paintings i'm standing in a section right now with wildlife paintings so we've all got something like that whether it's a a print that we bought at a ducks unlimited banquet to, for conservation or, or something we painted or who knows someone we know pencil pencil sketched a, a white-tailed deer who knows mm-hmm. but we all have that and that that's so it's, it's not that it's my collection it's kind of about us you know us the type of people that we are and, and I just, like I say, had the opportunity to to create this and hopefully set an example that uh, that others will follow and, and do the same thing. If we had one of these in every small town, you know, across North America, we would have a problem with animal rights or mm-hmm. anti hunters. They, they they wouldn't be able to say a thing, right? Because so this shows that hunting isn't about a kill. Hunting is never about a kill. That's that's a tiny one percent of a hunt. You know, we, we tend to focus on it because all of us that hunt already know about, you know, the effort that it takes, the practice, the, the yeah. equipment you have to understand, the, the studying of where you're going to go, the patience once you go there, you know, the, uh, and absolutely the skill to understand the animal. You know, we already know that, so we don't focus on that. We don't tell people, we just show a picture of me with my deer. And the people that don't understand us, of course, look at that and think, Oh, he's all about just killing that animal. No, it's not. It's we just don't bother spending a bunch of time explaining to people about the rest of hunting. And that, again, back to this museum, that's what this does. It shows them all of the aspects of hunting. The art, that's awesome. The, the spirituality, the science behind it, mm-hmm. and uh, and hopefully, I can say that uh, they understand conservation when they leave. Yeah, that's all. You know, that's super important. That's like a a trend now more than ever i feel like especially with mainstream media painting pictures of hunters in certain ways and that, it's kind of like the segue into 
the next thing we wanted to talk about here. And you made uh, a post online. I'm sure m- most of our listeners are familiar. You made it back in uh, back in November of 2018, and we reached out to you after that to to do this podcast because what happened in the post I thought was it needs to be talked about. And um, you know, and we're we're in Illinois, and a lot of people just don't get hunting, and they especially don't get bear hunting, and they like to add human personalities to grizzly bears and all that, and it kind of gives them a false a false look on what the reality of reality of it actually is. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately there was a tragic accident up in, in um, one of your territories, Yukon rogue river outfitting territory. Um, and I, I'll, I'll just kind of let you take it from here because I feel like you're going to do the best at explaining it and going into the situation and, and how it possibly could have been prevented and um, what needs to change up in that area. Yeah, you're you're referring to the the young lady yeah. mm-hmm. and the wife of, of the local chopper uh, who was killed by a grizzly bear, and she was killed when she was carrying her one year old daughter, who was also killed. And and this oh. it happened at our Einerson Lake uh, in my elfing territory, the Rogue River Elfing territory. Now Einerson Lake is about as remote a place as exists in this world today. It's, it's fly-in only, there's no roads. I mean, there are hundreds of miles from any road. The only people that ever go to that lake, you know, occasionally there's a prospector will go through there. Um, the, you know, conservation officers come through to check us for our licenses. And, you know, there's us, um, you know, myself, my family, my, uh, you know, our guides, and then our clients, our hunters, that, that come through that lake. And, and there's only, you know, I, I probably have three guides in there a year. You know, one one will be a cameraman and a couple of hunters. So, so it's not like this. This is remote, and, it, and it's you know, it's it's a place that we're very tuned into. You know, we we live there essentially in the, mm-hmm. the entire fall, and we, you know, about five years ago, we had a situation where a grizzly bear was trying to get into one of our cabins to kill one of the guides. So the other guide you know, heard the screaming and came out and, and uh, shot that grizzly bear on the porch of that cabin. Mm-hmm. Now, we have a very, very strict quota, a very controlled quota for grizzly bears up in the Yukon. It, it's, you know, they've managed, the, the wildlife management has been to, with the focus on increasing grizzly bears for about the last 40 years. And so I, I said to him, listen, we're seeing five bears a day, five grizzly bears a day. We're, we're you know, in one season, you know, documented different bears. I'll see 200 of the remaining 30 bears that you guys say exist in this area. You know, we're, there's, you've managed very successfully for more bears. And now we have more bears. Mm-hmm. So it's time to adjust the management plan to reflect the actual situation on the ground. Now, nobody has the gumption to do that these days. You know, they, they politically it's suicide for, for a politician to endorse that or to have, you know, bureaucrats that are, you know, he, he are under that politician at that given period that say, hey, we're going to increase the grizzly bear quotas for the outfitters out those areas because they're the only ones going out there to hunt. And and so what you have is a, a lack of will mm-hmm. in spite of the fact that they've been warned. And they have a lack of will because they won't be reelected. You know, so, so you've got people that have this conflict of interest. They can't do the right thing because they won't get reelected. So they have to do, you know, it's called demagoguery, do what the public wants. Well, the public doesn't know what it wants because... That's why we have leaders telling us what we should want and, and leading us. Anyway, they, they, the situation I warned them about, and I said someone's going to get hurt here, you know, in this place. There's too many bears in this area. And that area is about a 3,000 square kilometer area, a management zone. Uh, 3,000, well, you guys would be 2,000 square miles. Oh, thank you. I was trying to do the math in my head. Yeah, I, I was, yeah. Okay. So, so, so they... You know, and we're allowed three bears a year. Out of that whole area? Only? Yeah, yeah. So that that's 
pretty grizzly bears. And if we kill more than, you know, some year, some three year quota periods, if we kill one female, we're okay. If we kill two, the next three year quota period, we're only allowed three, one bear a year. And none of them can be females. You know? That so, is so a they huge managed. area. <laughs> yeah, it's a massive area. Right. And only three somebody, bears out of that? Yeah, that's it. So, so you know, what do you think? And we're very good at making sure that we don't ruin our quota for coming years. So we shoot male bears. You know, very, very, very seldom will one of our hunters take a female bear. So what you end up with is, you know, do the math. How long does it take for for bear numbers to skyrocket? And you start you know, with an exponential growth when they have no predators other than themselves. So anyway, this is... This is all the precursor, the lead up to this horrible, horrible, tragic situation that happened after we left the camp. I mean, I was in that camp this year. Yeah, I was hunting sheep, and I, you know, I saw five to seven grizzly bears a day. And, wow. and there's absolutely no doubt that I would have. Well, there, I can't say absolutely no doubt. There's there's a remote possibility that I didn't see the bear that killed this young lady. You know, and it was a big male bear. If I, if I wouldn't have been on such a strict quota, and as a hunter, I'm allowed one bear every three years personally, you know, I may have actually killed that bear and this never would have happened. Mm-hmm. Now, who knows? Right? You're, you're throwing this out there and saying, is, you know, oh, yeah, sure, sure, what are the odds, what are the odds? But, I mean, we live up there. It's our backyard. We know what's up there. So I would say that, my opinion, and I defy anybody to say they know better than my opinion. I, that's where I am. I've been there for the last 15 years. Exactly. You know, that might be, I'm pretty, pretty switched on. And I say that this could have been prevented with, you know, there's high odds it could have been prevented. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I, I, I was angry when that, when I wrote that post. Uh, I let it sit for, you know, after I heard about that, I, I received that horrible phone call and, and, uh, and I um, let it sit before I posted, and finally I just said, okay, enough, I, I can't. I have to say something. And, and essentially what I did was, was tell the truth. You know, it's my truth because I'm not a scientist. I just happen to live there. You know, the scientist has never been there. You know, but I've been there, mm-hmm. and I don't use a computer to tell me how many bears there are in my backyard. I just go look at them and say, okay, there's this many bears there. And, and I say there's too many bears in that area. They should be managed. And, and, you know, when you've been warned, isn't there some responsibility that falls upon somebody's shoulders for, for the, you know, the death of this young, beautiful lady and her beautiful child? You know, to me, if these bureaucrats don't have the spine to make the hard decisions or the politicians, then a politician shouldn't be allowed to make these decisions, they, you know, here in British Columbia, the you know they banned grizzly bear hunting, not not because it wasn't scientifically justifiable, sustainable, biologically defensible. They banned it because, and this is you know a rough quote um, or a paraphrase, because it's not socially acceptable. You know, Man. like what what kind of people rule? Because of not socially acceptable. Well, you know, I don't like people with long hair. So I think let's make them not have long hair. You know, I don't like people that eat curry. So let's make them not eat curry. I don't like people that are a color. So, you know, I mean, where do you draw the line on this thing? Right, right. It, it, yeah. you know, and I, of course, I'm not using me, myself, and I. You know, I'm talking about in, in third person. The, um, you know, you can't, you cannot govern by what what is socially acceptable or not, because people have different opinions about mm-hmm. what is and what isn't. Well, the, you know, and, the, and the majority might believe something, but that's tyranny by the majority. So I, my post basically called these people out, and, and uh, there, was, <laughs> there was a huge fallout from it because they don't want to be called out. They don't want to be singled out. The safest job you can have is in the government hidden away in the middle of some <laughs> bureaucratic do and you never have responsibility for what you actually accomplish and do during the day. Yeah, you know, the politicians just like I say, it's just uh, go by consensus and and not actually govern. 
So, so I called them out, and, and I think when this happens a second time, I said it was a grizzly bear plague. You now the scientists went crazy because you can't call it a plague. Okay, great. I'm not a scientist. I can call it what I want. Right. And I'm calling it like it is. <laughs> right. But next time it happens, next time it happens, they've been warned. They've been warned. Now, you cannot tell me when someone's been warned that someone's going to get hurt because of what you just said or did or made the law you just made or the rule you just made. So how how are your hands you know clean? How do you not have blood on them? And, and I'm hoping that the next time this happens, someone will not just me, but you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of us that have common sense will rise up and demand that someone pays for that. You know they we make criminals go to the prison when someone kills somebody by negligence. They should go to prison, and and this is, you know, this is where it sits right now. And it did not make a lot of people happy. Obviously, it went viral, and uh, I don't know how many millions of, of <laughs> right shared that, but it, but it was, it, it definitely made some waves. But it got the point out there, and most people are yeah. Well, you had the most you know, affected <laughs> point to make out of anybody out there, really, because. Like you said, you live in this area. You're yeah. you're the one. You're the boots on the ground there. You're the one that's affected by it directly. The people in the city that think it's unsocially acceptable or so, it's it's not socially acceptable to kill these grizzlies in these areas. They have no idea what they're talking about because it doesn't affect them. Exactly. Yeah, they're not they're not faced with with grizzlies. Yeah, it's um. This Come to is my a, backyard and check it out. Yeah, this right. is this is a post that uh, I believe that. It's our duty right now as hunters, everybody listening to this right now, we need to go back and share this again and again and again. And, you know, even though you're in in Canada, this will ring true in America. I mean, the the fact is you've got politicians playing playing political games, all this sit in that seat. Meanwhile, you've got a beautiful woman and her beautiful daughter dead because of a bear attack, all because they're like, well, I need to get votes, so I need these yeah, people who live it. in apartments to vote for me because they don't want to kill these grizzlies that we consider cuddly. And uh, they're, they're, well, most people think they're endangered. Or yeah, something, they think which they're is endangered. Weird. Yeah, and there was a, uh, a a part in your post that you put um, that was uh, I, I think CTV called you, and you gave your opinion. You're yeah. like, look, they're like, why did this bear? do this why would this bear was it deranged did it have a worm in the brain you know all this kind of nonsense and you basically were like look it's a grizzly bear it does this grizzly bears do this because they're the apex predator they saw the woman and child as prey they killed it that's what they do and now um there was an article i saw that uh somebody uh because i I was researching this somebody was uh, some researcher they were like well, let's do a necropsy so, you know, we can see. Was there something wrong with the bear mentally? You know, was it just hungry? Was it uh, out of hibernation? It needed, it needed therapy. And, like, it needed, it, dude, it was a bear, and it was doing bear things. And this is what <laughs> bears do. And uh, you tried to make that point, and they, I, I think they muted you, and I think that was a part in your post, if you want to touch on that a little bit. I'm a little fired up, uh, understandably, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I feel yeah. that. Yeah, well, we, Sorry, should, we should be. We can't. We can't. Hey, listen, you, you're you feel the same way as so many of us do, and and you know we're we're, we're tired of of no one listening when we're saying things, and, and when when they do this and they switch what we're saying, they spin it to make it sound like you know, we want every grizzly bear dead. No, we don't. No, we're we're hunters. We're you know, naturalists. We we do not want every grizzly bear dead. We love seeing them. But we know when there's an imbalance because we're out there. And, and so you just feel the same way. What is the common sense? And, and we need to, you know, that, that passion that you feel, what you really need to do is, is direct it in, in an effective way, which next time you guys get a chance to vote, vote for somebody who's on our side with this lifestyle, with common sense that won't care about demagoguery won't care what everyone thinks and i mean <laughs> you you have the opportunity down there to vote in again a president that's, that's actually backing us i mean donald trump jr is is a hunter 
you know, when have we ever had anybody? He, I just read today on Fox News that, that he's considered to be the, the new iteration of Teddy Roosevelt. Mm-hmm. You know, truly, truly one of the greatest presidents of the United States has ever, this world has ever seen, greatest leaders. Teddy Roosevelt, I mean, he was, the, he was at the forefront of the suffragette movement, women's liberation, mm-hmm. you know, equality for women. You know, he was the one that started the parks. He's the one that dug the Panama Canal. He did this. This is you have somebody coming up in your in your political circles that can do all of that. But, you know, we can we can screech and scream to the high heavens and it doesn't really do anything. But what we can do is vote and we have to vote mm-hmm. as in unity. You know, the, the politicians all say, why, why should we care what, what hunters think? You guys never vote. You know, and, and it's true. We, we, you know, we, we live and let live. We're, we're actually, in spite of the fact that we've been stereotyped as, as, you know, misogynists and racists, it's just the opposite. We're the most tolerant people around. Yeah. We'll have to go with the flow and we'll just let us go do what we do, which is spend our time in the wildlands. And so the politicians don't listen to us. We don't, we don't scream. We don't put placards. We don't protest. You know, and they go, why, why would we do anything to help you guys? Well, it's time for us to get together. Together, if we united, the, the 10 million of us that love the outdoors and, and actually think along the same lines in, in so, many, so many ways, if we would just vote, just go and vote and vote for the person that's, you know, got common sense, that's, that's going to protect our way of life, then... You know what? We can actually determine the outcome of every single election because the good news is we've never voted. So now, if we mm-hmm. vote in a block, we you, you, you know we don't have to put up with these clowns that that we have now in power. Now, I'm not talking your present president is actually you know he stands right up and says what he believes right. you know, loudly, right. and, and, and it's, you know he he goes for common sense. You know, you had Zinke as your uh, secretary, interior of the sec- or secretary of the interior. He was a hunter. He understood conservation. Now, I think he's since moved on. But uh, you know, you've got you you have the ability to protect our way of life going generations forward, and that's in your next election. If, if everybody, you know, that passion you you felt that you apologize for, don't no, just just focus it on accomplishing something, which is getting a hundred of your buddies to vote, 10 of your buddies, and get each one of them to get 10 of their buddies. And, and then, then we won't be dealing with this nonsense, this, this you know, tyranny by the majority that are urbanized. Right. It's, it's what it is. So, no, that did. But anyway, that's not, this, that's, this isn't fun stuff, you guys. You, you, your blog, you, you told me, you said, oh, it's a fun blog. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it, it's, but it, it's, it's yeah. necessary, though. It's it something is. that needs to be discussed. You know, yep. it can't all, all be fun and games all the time, which is we wanted to talk about this, and there's no better person to talk about it than with you. You know, you're you're the pioneer of this industry. You know, you're respected, and you have, a, you have the, in my opinion, the most valuable a valuable opinion, especially on this this issue in the in British Columbia and, and the Yukon. Um, do you think? I mean, after this accident happened, after what you said, does do you feel that anything has changed, or do you see any lean into and in, in, in change at all, or do you feel that it's going to just continue on the same way it has been? No, I, I think there's absolutely been change, and what it is 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 when they make a decision, I, I will guarantee you that this comes up. Say, whoa, let's just think about this for a second. Let's just think about this. Because what if, well, you know, what if this happens again on our watch and we made this decision to, to do whatever? You know, I, I, you know they, I'm not saying that they're going to do anything positive, but maybe they won't do anything negative again, you know, like, like banning grizzly bear hunting in British Columbia. I mean, absolutely ludicrous and there, yeah. there's so many barriers in this province 15,000 by the scientific estimates Ooh. and if they're as accurate as the areas that I'm used to you know they're out by you know a good four times you know Man. is there 60,000 I don't know how many there is but there's a lot and and so you, you know I think that 
it, it has made a difference. It's made them be aware that their decisions in their ivory towers have consequences that cost people their lives. Yeah, there was and, a and livelihood. So, yeah, there there was a uh, part in your post where it, it was towards the end, and you go, "Which one?" You, like you called them out, and this was the greatest thing I, I think I've ever seen in my life. You know, I, I I respect you, I respect your opinion, and it was like it it, it solidified you as um as one of the guys that needs to speak for us, you said, you know, which one of these politicians um, is going to stand up and say, yeah, I, uh, I'm i the guy responsible for this lady and her baby's death. I can read it. So here's a question right that I would really like answered. Who will be accountable when that tragedy happens in British Columbia? Who takes responsibility? Yeah. Who will say, yes, we were warned, but we felt the horror of this person or persons in the case of Valerie and Adele was simply the cost of doing business, the cost of us staying in power. Love that. Hmm. I, I, I was obviously very passionate that day. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, it's, it, it, you know, it's heartfelt. And, and you know, lightness aside, it, it, we all have to do it. We all have to make these people take responsibility for their decisions. And, and yeah. they will, you know. It's not that they don't, like I say, they may not make a positive choice for us, for our lifestyle, for wildlife management, but they may think twice next time before they pull the trigger on one of these asinine, imbecilic decisions that are based on a bunch of people living in a city that don't like a certain way of life Mm -hmm. and have no actual, you know, reality-based facts to to give them a, uh, even even a voice or an opinion, they shouldn't. Even, mm-hmm. you know, other than okay, they don't want they don't want things killed. Well, oh, neither do I. But but guess what? You know, right now today, ten billion different animals were killed: shrimp, mice, who knows, rats, yeah. cows, Life. chickens. There's seven point eight billion of us, and, and a lot of us had you know all you can eat shrimp at Red Lobster. Well, you know there's. You know, we personally ate 400 living animals today. You know, multiply yeah. that by 75 billion people. I mean, it's the reality. Yeah. And no, anyone that says that I'm a vegan, I don't, you know, I don't hurt anything. I have a small footprint. Give me a break. Those, those soybean fields for your tofu, they <laughs> used to be wildlife habitat. There used to be ducks living there. And now yeah. all that water is gone. And you're, you know, you're irrigating for, for soybeans. I mean, nobody... The, the, nobody can sit there and say, you know, that simplistic view of this world is is correct. It's not. Yeah. Everything has, is so intertwined. The, the um, you, know, we, you know, there's unintended consequences for everything, mm-hmm. and you, there's no cut and dried. I'm this way, so everybody should be that. Which, which, by the way, just makes me nuts. I mean, when was the last time you went to somebody and said, "You're a vegan. You only." Eat you know, vegetables, I eat meat. You're wrong. You have to eat meat. I'm right. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not, yeah, it's not something who, that we do. That? No, I never no, even think about doing that? that. Nobody does that except, no, no, but that's how they, that's how they feel. You know, it, it, it's, it's astounding to me. You know, these people are trying to shove their ideologies down other people's throats. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, well, but, but anyway, back to the post, I'm hoping that... Well, Jim, that I'll be honest with you here. <laughs> My wife read that post, and my wife, she's kind of she hunts a little, not a lot, um, but she respects it. She understands it. At home, we only try and eat wild game. Um, my wife right now is pregnant with our first daughter, and I think when my wife read this post, she's like, she kind of came to me. She's like, "This needs to be talked about. We need to like get this out." And I think a lot of people she works with, none of the, none of them hunt. They don't they don't understand hunting. They think it's weird that I'm so into hunting. Um, so, And I feel like it's important to discuss this for people that, that – an episode we could share with people that do, might not understand what we do and what it is. Um, well, like you said, like the combine thing. I work for John Deere. We make combines. I've spent a lot of time in combines. For someone to say that they don't – they have a small footprint, to see the amount of animals that get <laughs> ran through a flex draper in a wheat field <laughs> with a combine is just insane. And people don't realize this stuff is no matter what happens, for us to live, animals will die for our consumption. No matter where it is, whether you consume them or not, they're dying. If you eat kale, 
Something died when that kale was harvested. Yeah, I right. promise you. That's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. But yeah. there's so many yeah. people that don't really Calm understand it. hunting, and they think trophy hunting is this big, bad thing. And I, I try to do my best to explain that trophy hunting is just selective hunting and try to go into yeah. why selective hunting is is the better way to hunt. And you try and educate them. And you try and educate them as best right. as I can. Um, and. I don't know everything, and there's probably a ton of holes in my game. But how often are you hit with that um, that conversation in person, like one on one, in the flesh, face to face, where you have to kind of like break this down to someone, like, "Hey, listen, this, you know, with all due respect, you're wrong, but I'm going to explain why." Uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't happen to me very much. You know. I, and I, I think it's partially because of my age. I mean, I'm 61, and I've lived this life, you know, lived it. Not not just talk the talk, but, you know, walk the walk. And it, it, very, very few people will, will, you know, actually attack me head on. I mean, you know, or even... You're also a really you know, big dude too, so I gotta add that in. <laughs> That's six <laughs> four. Well, yeah, they're, they're yeah they're, they're a little imposing. Maybe that maybe that keeps them off a little bit. But but I, you know, I, the, the, here's the reality: the, the vast majority of the people actually have common sense, are actually interested in knowing the truth, and actually don't appreciate when they've been snowed or you know had their you know been lied to, and, and suddenly that's exposed. You know, most most people are pretty sentient human beings, and they, they, you know, there's yeah, there's ten percent hate us, and there's ten percent of us love each other, and then there's eighty percent that you know may sway this way or that way depending on the, you know, what they read on the newspaper recently. If there's a Cecil debacle going on, then maybe they don't like hunting. But but for the most part, most people are are open minded, and, and I, I've. I mean, the ones that aren't, well, you're never going to change them. And, and yeah. fair enough. I mean, they, you know, they were, they're there for a reason, you know, whatever, whether you believe in God or Darwin, but, you know, they're there probably to balance us because maybe if, if we go crazy, maybe we hunt too much and then the tribe starves, you know, if we're too good at what we do. So you need to have mm-hmm. the basket weavers out there telling us, hey, don't, don't, don't kill anymore. And, and maybe that's, you know, like you say, who's to say that that's not that that's wrong to have these people with their side of the of the story, their you know their opinion. Maybe right. it's just there for balance. Maybe that's why we're all here. I, I don't know, but I do know that eighty percent of the people, uh, you know, they're, they're actually pretty open to to hearing what you know, the truth is, mm-hmm. and they're not appreciative when they realize, wow, I've been lied to. Yeah, yeah, you've been lied to. That's right. Yeah, popular press is not doing you any favors if that's what you use for your news. So, so I, you know, I, I haven't, you know, I, you know, sure I get the death threats, you know, I get all the, you know, the attacks. I mean, there's some couple of idiots just recently that were, you know, they're following me on social media. <laughs> one, one of these clowns, you know, you know, they, you know they're, they're fake accounts and they're, they're animal rights groups that are, that are trolling. And, they, you know, they have, you know, their name is Hunter Saloon. And they're you know belong they're life members of literally every single club, including Roland and Ward. You go, who even knows what organization that is over here in North America? Like they're, they're so out of touch, they think we're that stupid. So you, you know, you, you, these people are always on my back, but they don't, you know, they, they haven't, other than you know, poison razor blades and stuff like that. It, but it's pretty, it's pretty cowardly attacks, and, and you know, they're. Like I say, it's not a, those people, you, you can't change their opinion. They're, they're, you should actually just feel sympathy for them. Yeah. Because it, 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 their, their hearts are often in the right place. Maybe they had a bad childhood. I don't know what their reasoning is. Or, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> if I can let that slide, that, just, yeah. that was funny. <laughs> Well, I'll say this, Jim. Steve's, Steve's our resident basket weaver here at Working Class Bowl. Oh, Art. come on. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fact. On, dude. Dude, I, dude, I only weave mugs. I don't got time for baskets. <laughs> well, in the time we have left, man, I, I do appreciate you talking about all that. And I know, you know, it's 
it's serious stuff, but I feel like it's super important to talk about, and there's no better person to talk about it than you. So I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of open that back up and, and discuss that a little bit with us. But what, what I do want to move on to a little bit, and everyone knows you from Jim Shockey's Hunting Adventures, um, watch that on Outdoor Channel, and Jim Shockey's Uncharted, which I got to say, yeah. that show is so incredible. And I feel like that show is so responsible for getting a lot of people who might not have had an an interest initially in to get in hunting at all. But I think the adventure and all that can pull them in, and you do the the whole side of it on the education part, and just make mm-hmm. an entertainment travel experience show that anyone can enjoy. So I just want to thank you for that because. I think that show alone is responsible for a ton of interest in what we all love and are passionate about. Well, I appreciate that. And 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 I, like I say, I had the opportunity to reach a a big audience and, and, you know, you can do it to try and make yourself famous and sign hats and do selfies with everybody or, or you can, you know, shoulder the responsibility and, and use it responsibly. So, so, that's what I tried to do was say, okay, with this voice, I'm hoping, and in the end, this is truly what I hope, is that if I have a legacy, it's, you know, say that, you know, he made a difference on people's opinion, a positive difference on people's opinion of hunting and what hunters are all about. And I would, you know, I, that, that I, I would spend the rest of eternity being happy about that and, and that show uncharted and even you know, our hunting adventures that's that's what we tried to do was was make a positive difference impact people that don't hunt that you know not against it just don't hunt and, and try and explain to them bring them along for that other 98 percent of what a hunt is really about mm-hmm. and, you know, it right. is culture it's adventure it's humor it's family you know th- these are the these are the aspects that we we've focused on and like i said you you, you guys when I'm long gone, you guys are young. You, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you'll be singing the same praise 30 years from now and saying, "Yeah, he made a difference. It helped us in our in our view of what hunting is and our responsibility, what our resp- responsibilities are as hunters." So, so that that uh, I, I appreciate the compliments. Like I say, that uh, means a lot. It means, means that we accomplish what we were what we set out to do with those, those that pro- programming. Yeah, I'll be sure. I'll, I'll I'll be singing that and your uh, number one uh, iTunes on the <laughs> blues charts hit Howlin'. <laughs> I'll be Howlin'. singing that. <laughs> no, really though, Jim, you are. I know you're you're so humble that you, you probably don't think this, but you sir are a living legend, and mm-hmm. to it's everyone out fact, there that yeah. that loves hunting yeah. and is passionate about hunting, you are you are you're bigger than Fred Bear in my opinion. You're the modern day legend of all things hunting and conservation and just kind of exposure to cultures. When you think of someone doing adventure hunts and going somewhere crazy, it's you. Yeah. And you go to places I've never even heard of. <laughs> or would even think about yeah. going. Yeah. So kind of going <laughs> off that, it's incredible. I'm like, where is he? Yeah. How do you do the research to, like, go to uh, – <laughs> we, uh, your buddy Michael Waddell uh, told us about a hunt that you might have went on with fly swatters. Allegedly, it's a joke. Um, but like, at what what goes into that when you? I'm like, how how do you get to the point where you go, okay, uh, I'm going to go to this area and I'm going to hunt this. Like, how do you? What's the process with of doing with, that? with places that probably don't even have hunting rules and regulations? Like, man, that's an insane process to me. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, you got to you have to remember that I've been doing this for for fifty years. Mm-hmm. So, so over that time, I mean, I'll, I'll hear about you know Somalia, and, and I'll hear about the Byra antelope. Maybe James Mellon, who is a, a great great hunter, um, won the Weatherby Award back in the probably seventies. Um, you know, he he went into Somalia and hunted the Byra antelope, and he considered it. To be one of the the greatest of all the, the African big game species. So I mean, you know, I this is what I I've lived. So I, I hear this, talk to the people, and say, well, has anybody been there since? No. Uh, why? Well, Somalia. You know, duh. You don't go there. You get killed. <laughs> yeah. so, right. so so you know, but but that 
that's what people tell you, but and then you, your next question should be, have you been there? And they go, well, no. Well, how do you know? How do you know that? You know, you've made an unequivocal statement, and uh, you didn't equivocate on the statement, and, and yet you've never been there. So, so right. this is what I've always done. I've just questioned. So, okay, well, maybe there's a way. You know, who, anybody been there? You know, and when you start researching, you realize, well, wait a minute, Somalia is actually broken up into three countries now. And one of those countries is Somali land, which is in the north, a long way away from Mogadishu, or, you know, Black Hawk Down and all that country. Mm. And they've started their, you know, they've got their own government, they've got their own currency. Um, you know, they had a civil war, they declared independence. We just don't recognize it. So we call it Somalia, but they call themselves Somali land. And, and so you, you know, you, you go, oh, well, if they've got their own government, maybe what's going on with the wildlife there is a viral antelope that James Mellon hunted way back when in the 60s. You know, they're, that's in Somali land. But yeah, that's right. And do they have a wildlife management plan? No. You contact their minister of environment and say, what are, you, what are you doing with the wildlife? Well, we don't have any money. Well, what if I raise the money, you know, and gave it to you? And, and you know, you know well, we'd love that. What about a national park? Do you have one? No. You need one because no one's going to take you seriously as an independent country without a national park system. So we don't have any money. Well, what if we raise it and give it to you? Good. So, so you do that, and, you know, and with no strings attached, you give them the money. And, and they, you know, the president of the country, thankful, says, hey, you know, I'm, I'm allowed as president of the country to allow, you know, a viral antelope to be hunted. Would you like to do that? Well, yeah, maybe I volunteer. So, so I mean, there's there's the process. It it's, takes years and years and years, and you have to keep your ears open while you're doing that. To you know, what what was around then is probably still around. The reasons we're not going there can be myriad, but they're you know none none of them are insurmountable. I mean, within reason, uh, you can't get into China right now, but you know you could. It opened up before they had the Olympics there. So, so you just be aware of well, that country's open now. Let, let's, let's, I want to be there first in line. Let's go explore. Let's go check it out. Wow. So I decided. Dude, that's, that's one of the most you know, insane things I've ever heard. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it's insane. Great or, national park there. Jim Shockey, no. not only the greatest hunter in uh, Canada and North America, but like. You're, you're opening up the world. And, you know, to go to a country like Somalia um, that have these animals where you're like, look, if you establish a national park, your country could make tons of money. You know, you're going to these countries. Dude, Jim Shockey is the greatest human being to ever live. I'll say it right now. <laughs> that is insane. <laughs> uh, man, that's, you're his number one Canadian now, Jim. You are. Uh, you beat Jeff Healy. All right. And I never thought because Jeff Healy wrote confidence, man, but you just edged him. That is insane. Well, well, I appreciate that, but I mean, it, it's <laughs> so not humble just too. Me also. There's other, you know, there's other, there's other people. Steve Coldring, you know, Steve Coldring was the one that told me that the Byrantoa was there. I mean, they, like there, there's a, a network of these explorers that are out there walking the walk that you never hear about because they're in some darn jungle for six months straight, living with the pygmies. You know, trying to trying to get a uh, a pygmy hippopotamus, you know. So, so, you know, these guys are out there, and they're they're kind of the guys that I, you know, I hang with, and, and so it's not, and, you know, and, and don't think for a second I have the money to do that. I had to go to very very wealthy people and explain to them, listen, here's a situation over in this country. Um, I think it's a good thing for you to spend some of your billions on, and and so it's not, you know, I mean, I might have the connections and the. I get you know the respect or the ability to to raise the funds that people trust me that it's going to be used for these purposes, you know. But but you know, and, and I'd like to say yeah, I, I really am wonderful, aren't I? But but the, the reality is I got to have to buy a antelope, you know. So so you know it, it's it's a little bit self serving in a way. You know, and, and we got to bring the show to the rest of the world to show them what Somali land is like right now. And, you know, it, it's. Uh, you know, it, it, like I say, I, I just do what I do, and the the end result I'm hoping in the end, when the, the dust settles that it, it's a positive influence. And I do appreciate all you're saying. I, I 
still don't think I'd put me above Shania Twain, but, but <laughs> I would. That's awesome. <laughs> If you're not music lovers, then okay, maybe, but definitely not above Mike Babcock. There's no way. <laughs> Dude, I watched uh, I watched uh, Hunt with Mike Babcock re- uh, on your show, uh, one of your shows recently, and um, I don't want to get into it. We're pressed on time, but um, we'll talk about that next episode. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Any, any, any time, gentlemen. Like, like I said, you're, you're, you can, I, I'm around when I'm. When I'm here now, and it looks like I'm going to be around a lot more over the next 20 years, and I've got an entire library of exploration books and hunting books that I have to read over the next 20 years. So, so I'll be around a lot more. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for doing the show, man. We really appreciate you, and congratulations on the announcement of the uh, the other grandkid on its way from Eva. Um, yeah, we're pretty excited about that. We're actually heading out there in a couple of days. Uh, to hang with Tim and Eva. We're headed to the Dixie Deer Classic. I'll be one day I'll be there in, in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. So yeah, we're, we're, we're excited. That's ultimately the most important thing for everybody yes. is this family. And yeah, definitely. All this man. other stuff doesn't matter. We have to keep that in mind that uh, that's why we're here on this earth and, and, you know, go hug the person you love because it's, it's a fragile, fragile place we live in. Great. No doubt. Well, thank you so much, man. Stick around on the phone for a second. I just want to thank everyone for tuning into this show. I hope you learned something. If you can do one thing, please share this with someone, even if they hunt or not, and say, hey, maybe just check this out. Share it with your friends. Or tell them to check out Jim Shock. Yeah, you know? if you're yeah. in the check British it. Columbia area, go to that museum. Yeah. Check Absolutely. out Jim Shockey's yeah, Uncharted awesome. and Jim Shockey's Hunting Adventures. Jim, you got anything else you want to add quick before we close her out? Nope, looking forward to uh, seeing you guys up here at the Hanneman Museum someday. I'd love to do it, <laughs> man. Yeah, awesome. All right, everyone, thanks for listening. You know what to do. Go shoot your bow. We love you.